I'm Hassan Sadri, ophthalmologist uh, with Visionary Eye Institute at Newport Beach, California. We're here at OIS AAO 2019 here in San Francisco. It's actually pretty nice weather, isn't it? Gorgeous. This is a great time of year. A great time of year, yeah. Sometimes it can get foggy, though. Not this time of year. <laughs> yeah, that's I, I, true. I grew up out here. So oh, you I, did? Okay, is, uh, very good. This is my hometown. Yeah, I, I did research when I was a medical student at Moffitt uh, at UCSF uh, mm -hmm. when I was a uh, Michigan, but uh, I guess it was the memories I had was you're right. It was summertime. It was it must always have been summertime. Yeah, yeah, it's cold. Yeah, well, foggy. It's, it's what Mark Twain say: the coldest winter he's ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. That's right. That's right. Well, we'll we're glad to have you. This is Anthony, president um, and uh, of Ocular Therapeutics. He's CEO. Um, we're just catching up here at OIS, and it's, I'm excited to have him because he's you know you have some great stuff that you you're. Um, you know, having on the marketplace and as ophthalmologists, we're very excited. So tell us what's going on. Yeah, well, this is our, as I mentioned before, this is our coming out party. So we're your brand new debutantes. We've just launched our first product. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, it wasn't anticipated to be our first product. Our first product was supposed to be our glaucoma product. Um, but Extenza moved its way through much more quickly. Uh, we had a couple of stumbles along the way. One thing you realize, delivery is not easy. Yeah. You kind of think that it's going to be simple. My whole life, I remember the last 15 years, have been spent in essentially delivery technology companies. And you think it's a, an afterthought, you think the molecules are hard, but the delivery is pretty hard as well. So, but we we're out with a new product and it's a brand new route of administration. We're trying to challenge each other to think of when is the last time a brand new route of administration was brought onto the market. You think of things like transdermals or oh, it's been, it's been decades, inhaled probably. products. Yeah, yeah, it's been for a long time. Yeah, and no, nobody can come up with exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah. You think like intervitreal injections, they say, well, that's an injection. It's still, it's still out of a needle. It's not, but depending on how you parse it, it's been a long time since <laughs> yeah. a brand new route of administration has been, has been brought to the market. And it's replacing something that started in the 1860s. So it's replacing a technology finally after 150 years to, to have a whole new modality about how to get drug to the surface of the eye, which is what the company's geared to do. We're, we want to make drops obsolete. And the first place to do that is from the canaliculus, but we're going to do it from the intracameral region. We're going to try and do it from the, the vitreous, maybe the suprachoroidal space, maybe the fornix. But this, the whole sort of uh, geography of the eye is, is open to hydrogel now that we've proved that we can get to market with, uh, with, with Dextan. It's exciting. I mean, you know, we, we have patients in the, in the clinics that just don't take their drops, you know, even post-op. You know, I had a patient last week, I operated like, what drops? I said, what, do you mean, what <laughs> drops? I mean, we wrote it, we tattooed it on your arm. They're like, yeah. what drops? I said, the drops you use before and after, like, oh, those drops. I didn't get them refilled for the second eye. Yeah. So you're, actually, you're dead on. You're dead on. And, and what happens to them? Their eyes become, what, red and irritated. So tell, tell us, I know you've been working on glaucoma, other platforms. What are you excited about as far as in the pipeline? Well, the pipeline has, has two products in particular that, that, that are in phase one that I'm extremely excited about. One, one is, is OTX TIC, which is an injection in, into the intercameral space with, uh, with Travaprost uh, containing a uh, hydrogel rod. Um, you might have heard about the program with Allergan, sure. which is Bermatoprost in, yeah. in a PLGA technology. Sure. And we got into this business because, well, actually my predecessor, I know you know Omar, so yeah. brilliant, brilliant man. Um, but he started the program because, he, because of the things that he, he wanted to improve upon. He wanted, he wanted to build a better mousetrap. And what we expected to happen with the drug is what's happening. You inject it into the intercameral portion of the eye. Hydrogel is like a sponge, so water has access to the entire matrix from the moment it's injected. So you inject it in, into the intercameral space, it fills up with fluid, it falls into the inferior angle and becomes soft and gelatinous. Once in the inferior angle, it doesn't move. The other thing about it is that because water has access to the entire matrix, there's no differences in pH and the resorption can be programmed. And we program the resorption of the insert to last for six months. And we've now dosed uh, about 15 patients and in every single one of those patients who've made it to six months, what you see is you see, you, you see the, the depot at five months, you see a little bit at six months, it's completely gone at seven. And it's like clockwork. That every, early, interesting. Everyone go, goes at the same time, so you'll have no stacking. But the really interesting bit is the biologic response. And this is also what Allergan has seen in their, in their program. And we certainly didn't anticipate this when we started, mm -hmm. but, but that we have one patient out now to 16 months 
and it still has efficacy equal to or better than drops. Interesting. So we have drops in the control eye, and we have the, the, the insert sure. in, the, in the active eye. And, and almost everyone we've seen has had efficacy out to uh, as long as we've been able to track, because the, the longest patient we've had now is out to 16 months, still hasn't needed to be rescued. So that, that's That's thrilling. very exciting. And, and that's, that's one of our phase ones. Another one of our phase ones, we have a, a, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that we deliver intravitrally. And we finished our first phase one cohort with that. And we've taken patients who are patients with a lot of fluid, very, very sort of you know, poor vision, because in phase one, you typically take uh, particularly in, in injections. Refractory, in the eye, yeah. Refractory patients. And, and the depot is exact, acting exactly as we had anticipated. No issues with the depot. It's, it, it's going away when we, we, we thought it would. Um, we're yet to present on what that data is going to look like, but, but it's a very, very interesting approach. As you know, there's Graybug and Kodiak and, and, and Panoptica, that, that there are lots of signals out there of what TKIs can do and how they can be used. And we're writing a little bit on their coattails, slightly behind, but we're formulation people, and this is a formulation product. So we, we inject a, a, a cylinder, a very tight cylinder, and with a 27-gauge needle into the back of the eye. Beautiful. And it, it, it stays for six to nine months, and then it delivers the, uh, the TKI dose, which can also potentially last longer than the depot itself. So we're very excited about what we have. So it's, it's interesting because both pipelines, you're, you're smart. You're actually kind of dovetailing a little bit from de, or you're de-risking it, which is really smart. I mean, from a standpoint of, yeah. of modalities, right? Yeah. So I think that that's, a, that's really, really smart. So phase one, take us to phase two, A and B, and then eventually phase three, you're going to do all three, you think? Or you, what's your I plan? I don't think you need to. I mean, yeah. I certainly with, a, with, with the, the, the travel frost. Yeah, um, because there, why? Because there's data already available. There, yeah, you know how it's going to work. The question sure. is the formulation. Sure. And what we're doing now in phase one is optimizing the formulation. And Once you have that, then you go to the agency. Once you have that, you go to the agency, and you can potentially do it phase two, three. Got it. And, and that, that is because given the duration of action that we're seeing, yeah. it, it, can be, it can be registered as a single-dose therapy. Gotcha. Interesting. And, which means you don't need to do repeat dosing, which is in, in the, with the FDA That's approval. That's the, novel. Yeah, it's, well, it's, once again, it's, we're, we're, we're a follow-on program from, you know, what Allergan has done, which is fantastic, that, yeah. that, that, that approach and the, yeah. I think the, What's happening with the trabecular mesh work with prostaglandins delivered directly in the inferior angle to the trabecular mesh work was unanticipated. I think Allergan didn't anticipate it, and you know, we're, we're, we're actually seeing what they appear to be seeing from the data that, the, the data that, that they've shown, um, but with a, with a different technology, different delivery technology sure. that we think is, is a better mouse. No, I, th I like it. And then, you know, the, again, compliance, right? So yeah. compliance, compliance, compliance. So you're going to enter a world where there's going to be a lot less emphasis on drops. Drops, I'm sure, um, some forms are going to be around, but it'll, it'll probably be pretty. And, and the other thing is, I think, as you know, is there's a code for it. So I think physicians, can be, it's more aligned for them to be able to re register everything in, in the clinic potentially. Right, with the procedure code for 356T, which is our procedure code for the intercanalicular. So any intercanalicular approach that we have, and I forgot to mention we had a, completed a phase three with, our, with, with OTXTP, which is a, also a travel cross containing, uh, but steady state delivery of, of uh, micro-encapsulated travel cross via an intercanalicular insert. And in that phase three program, we had nine time points um, over, over a three-month period, uh, three diurnal time points over, over, over a three-month period with three, three check-in periods, so nine endpoints. And we were statistically Great. significant at eight of the nine. We'll have a conversation with, uh, with the FDA on October 30th about, which is the first time the FDA has really been challenged with the idea of how important is compliance. Now, we missed one of the one of the endpoints. We missed 8 a.m. and week 12, but we got 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Uh, is is that a drug that the FDA sees because of its compliance benefits? It, it's assured compliance that that it's it, it it's a that they'll look at it as that a clinically benefit. meaningful benefit, and it's hard to handicap how that goes. But I have to admit, when I see OTX TIC and I see the the, the duration of action. I see the drops in the middle of mercury that we, we can see from the, the, the phase one, you know. It's I, remarkable. 
Yeah, I don't know whether I would do it with an intercamel <laughs> insert or, or an intercamel, but the intercamel looks like the, 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 the modality to go. Yeah, I think, you know, quickly we're going to see um, a world where patients have that option. And it's funny because initially when you talk to the patients, um, I, w I was expecting pushback because of this as a procedural-based therapy. But no, in the clinic, it's been, it's been just a concept of, oh, yeah, I don't have to go to the pharmacy anymore. I don't have to deal with the prior odds. I don't have to worry about remembering to take my jobs. That's very, very wildly popular yeah. as a concept. Well, I, I also think compliance. One, one of the things when I really, one of my earlier experiences in the pharma industry, I, I ran the, the anti, antiviral uh, division at Bristol-Myers Squibb. I see. And this was in the early days of HIV. And uh, um, one of the things I was me and a number of other people, not just me, we were successful in convincing essentially our CEO who was pressing for, for, uh, um, for uh, patent rights in, in South Africa and a number okay. of other developing countries and convinced them to say, don't. You know, this, this is, all this is going to do is jeopardize patents in general around the world. We understand how we feel about patents in, 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 the, in the pharmaceutical industry. But if, if we enforce them unnecessarily, then, then we're actually going to wind up jeopardizing these patents. And that we should actually give away at cost medicines in the, in the developing world for HIV. And we worked then with some uh, other agencies that actually made them not only sort of at cost but free and delivered directly to the patients. And even then, the, the, the treatment levels went from about 1% of patients who are HIV positive to about 1.5%. Wow. So, they thought it was about, uh, about cost and about access and about distribution. It wasn't. But it wasn't. People don't take their medicines. It's just behavioral. It's just behavioral. It's just, it's just well, in that environment, they, there's no history of, of taking regular medications. But even when people have a regular history yeah. of it, and we live in the world we live in, people don't take their meds. No. No. And then there's, there's a lot of good data behind that. You're, the National Eye Institute data so definitely supports that, especially when you're adding medications. You know, everything goes down precipitously. Yeah. Very well, it's good. not only whether you take it, it's whether you take it correctly. Yeah. And that's yeah. where eye drops come in as, as they're hard to take. They're more annoying than, than what a tablet would be. And they're harder to take correctly. It's kind of hard to take a tablet incorrectly. You know whether you've swallowed it or not. But with an eye drop, you think, "Hey, I got it in. This, this is the, the this is this is there, and yeah. it's just rolling down your cheek." Well, I was telling Kevin uh, earlier yesterday, we had a patient that hey, yeah, she was on latanoprost, and her pressure, his IRP pressure, wouldn't wouldn't budge, and she would take it. And I mm -hmm. called the pharmacy. Yeah, she was taking. She's refilling it. Sure enough, I said, "Take, show me how you put your drop." <laughs> she opens her mouth, and she's putting <laughs> yeah. her mouth. True yeah. story. It's yeah. remarkable. And so there's these assumptions that you know you would think that they're. You know, uh, I said, wow, that's, you know, it's remarkable. So to your point. Okay, so let's pivot a little bit. So OIS, how has this helped you? I know this is, I know this is your couple of years in now. Tell us about OIS. Is this uh, something that worthwhile for you to go and you recommend it? It's fabulous. I mean, OIS, what, what a company like ours needs with OIS is we, we can't do things alone. And the, the equity markets are volatile. And the people who, who invest in your company or who are selling the marginal uh, stock in your company, most of them don't even know what it is you do. I mean, over time, the market will figure it out, but, but when it comes to being able to access capital that you need in order to be able to develop your products, you, 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 you need help. Sure. You, you need people with ideas, you need people with networks, um, but you also need potential partners who can help you bring things forward. And the beautiful thing about OIS is that there's big companies, there's small companies, there, there's people with ideas, and that OIS links up all of that together, and, and sort of brings the microcosm of uh, of uh, ophthalmology together. Yeah, it's it's a special meeting, and I've I've gotten to know them, especially the leadership, uh, and it's just they 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 get it. Okay, so tell us a little bit about you. So, you're if you're going to mentor someone, and they're you know they're in college, do they just wake up? I'm going to be president, CEO of a Pharma one day. How, how, what's your career path? Tell us a little bit about, about what happened. What what made you you know? Would you study? How'd you get here? Well, I'd, I'm pretty odd duck for the industry. I actually was, I, I was a, initially a, a terrorism expert before it was fashionable to be a terrorism wow. expert. And back then they called it religious violence. But this was this was before 9/11. It was in the days of the Soviet Union and the what they called the bipolar world. Then it was before bipolar became an actual condition. <laughs> <laughs> and I was uh, basically at, at Columbia um, getting my PhD um, in political science, and I realized I couldn't get my PhD read because the, uh, the people within this, the, the department were all cold warriors, 
they had no interest in looking at religion as an as a as a interesting. as an interesting discourse in uh, in in, uh, in political science. So they said, well, you should go to a school of theology. I said, well, I'm, theology is not what I'm studying. I'm studying how how religious violence impacts the the political the political map. Um, turned out I was right, but you know, timing's everything. You were ahead. I was. Of the I was right at the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. So, so I needed a job, right? And I, most most of my uh, research was field research. So I, I, I had some a pretty good capability with languages. I spent a lot of time actually in, in the north of India, in pa in, in uh, not Pakistan, in, in the Punjab, and I spoke a, a bit of Hindi, and I, I had a, a good cultural understanding of, uh, of India. And I, I just met somebody um, at, at, uh, at Columbia who was uh, um, working with a pharmaceutical company that was in a joint venture that had gone bad. And they were looking for a way, a, a consultant who would help them understand the cultural and linguistic issues they were facing in the joint venture. And I said I had no interest. And working in pharmaceuticals was, was uh, really nothing I'd ever considered in my entire lifetime. And they said, well, it paid $800 a week. And at that point in my life, eight hundred dollars a week was more than I ever That's thought I would earn. That's serious cash back then. That's serious cash, exactly. That was a lot of beer money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So no I more, said no yes. more top ramen. Yeah, I said yes, <laughs> yeah. and it's now almost thirty years. Wow, that's great. Every, you know, for the first MBA. Week. Did you go to the MBA route or no? Yeah, what, what I did is I, I I sort of finished off my education um, and and did a, what's called a master's in international affairs with a specialty in international business and finance. Gotcha. So I, I'd, I'd done the coursework on my uh, my, my poli-sci PhD, and I, uh, I could just finish up then, and I got a master's degree, and so Perfect. it more or less passed as an MBA. And the, the, That's the, great. The companies seemed to, seemed to take it as that. MBAs, anyway, is a key, because then they just, you have to keep going. Right, it's not gonna. It's not gonna give you. It's not the end. Though it gives you some basic framework, but you got to keep studying, right? I was you agree with that? Something you do well yeah. takes you yeah. a little while before you look good enough in a suit to get a job. Correct, <laughs> correct. Very good, very good. And then so the five-year plan. What's your what are you, what's your goal with the company? Full pledge, anterior, posterior segment drop. Basically, drop less, if yeah. you will. Company is that what you're is in ophthalmics? Oh. The idea is much bigger. I mean, that my, my first me. interest in ocular was I, I was running a, a multi-billion dollar company in Europe that, that had some new molecules, but also had some delivery technologies. Uh, and I was looking for a new basis for, essentially, for our entire R&D system. And my first interest in ocular was I wanted to buy it. I remember the early discussions I'd had with, with Amar. Um, Amar was, was uh, you know, he's a brilliant, brilliant entrepreneur and a brilliant uh, uh, chemist, um, but he'd gone well beyond where, where I, I think he put it to me, he goes, if I would have known what I was doing, I would have done it already. So he, he knew that pharma was a different space and one that he didn't want to be in for long, and he wanted somebody then to come in and actually run the company. So it was, it was a, a fairly sort of interesting conversation where it went from, I'm interested in buying the company to come maybe you should come and run the company. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, he's Amar, a good sales guy. He is fantastic. And he's just a, such yeah. a wonderful human yeah. being and such a, such a great mentor for me. Uh, and, and we had this great relationship. We spent a lot of time. Also, I had some background in the Punjab, and he comes from the Punjab, so we, we sort of hit it off in that, yeah. in, in that framework. Um, but then I came over to, to, uh, to Ocular, and, and you know, my goal is clearly we are an ophthalmology company, and that's where our heritage is always going to be. But what we do is we build superior therapeutics by delivering them locally. So we don't use the blood to deliver the drugs, that, that, that deliver the therapeutics, and that changes the therapeutic. Yeah. So if you think about like inhaled corticosteroids or LABAs, if you put them through the blood, they're not life-saving drugs. You put them in the inhaled form, and then you, you, you treat asthma and COPD with these drugs, you have a different therapeutic. So we got to get away from this idea that, that delivery, that, that all the magic is in the molecule, and that delivery somehow is just a clever way to make that molecule more effective. Delivery can fundamentally change the molecule. It can reopen the window of the therapeutic window. And we have a couple of products now in development that are novel mechanisms of action in pain that we've, we've licensed in on an MTA um, that, that have failed in phase two. They had efficacy, but they failed in phase two because of off-target uh, toxicities. So the idea of what we do is we formulate them, we deliver them locally, we don't use the blood, we avoid the, the systemic toxicity, and we can get up to doses that are efficacious 
and essentially make the, make this molecule something that can help patients. And Interesting. Pain is an area of huge passion for me. Um, my previous company was was very very heavily in, in, into pain, and, and there there hasn't been a new mechanism of action in pain since gabapentin. So it's been 20 years. You think about why we have an opiate crisis. One of the reasons why is because we have no new medicines, and the major reason why we don't have new medicines is because of off-target effects. Because people have pain in different parts of their body, but they're using the blood to move it around, right. and then you get an off-target effect. And you get all this AEs and, and whatnot. Gotcha. Interesting. Right. Fascinating. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure. We could talk for another couple hours. It's been, it's been an honor meeting you, and I wish you the greatest luck and enjoy the rest Great. of your meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much.